Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to this morning's study. And uh, we're going to continue looking at uh, Revelation 17, 12, 13, and 17. And right now we're going through Bob Pickle's paper on the seven heads and uh, trying to sort out his arguments, um, which he has basically the pioneer's view, but uh, a lot of things that we notice that don't make sense. So anyway, before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? <clears throat> Dear Father in heaven, thank you for the study today and for each person who has joined in this study and that will join and those that will watch later on YouTube. Uh, we invite, Lord, your presence to teach us. We know, Lord, that there's much that we do not understand. And uh, we've been struggling with these um, these studies over the last little while, but we see your hand leading us. And so we ask for your continued presence and guidance. Be with us now through thy spirit, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, good morning again. Now, <clears throat> just a quick review before we go back to Bob Pickle's paper. Um, We've been looking at uh, the pioneer view on Revelation 12, 13, and 17, and also looking at, um, uh, well, we looked at the pioneer's view. We read Uriah Smith's, some of his article, which we're going to get back to. Um, but we wanted to look at Bob Pickle's paper because it's a little bit shorter. And we had gone through all of these symbols. We spent a lot of time covering different aspects of, of prophecy, uh, you know, looking at the book of Esther, uh, Daniel chapter two, um, looking at the, the, the Kings, we're looking at Millerite history, the seven thunders, all these different things to now focus upon revelation 17. The main thing that we noticed is that, the beast of Revelation 12, 13, and 17, even though they have these similarities, they're not the same beast. They also are, well, for instance, the beast of Revelation 12 is pagan Rome. The beast of Revelation 13 is papal Rome. Now, because they have similarities, uh, as far as I know, almost everybody would look at, once you recognize the seven heads in the beast of Revelation 12, you're going to keep the same seven heads in each of the beasts. We can see that that's not consistent, that there's no reason to assume that the seven heads on the beast of Revelation 12, the great red dragon, are the same heads or represent the same thing as the seven heads on the beast of Revelation 13, the leopard-like beast. And, and since that's the case, that we could make a case for the pioneer view of the seven heads on, Revel on the beast of Revelation 12, that is the great red dragon. Um, but we could not apply that to the leopard-like beast, that that view that they're the seven uh, uh, forms of Roman government, we couldn't do that with the beast of Revelation 13, and that we took a view that is that these are the kingdoms of Bible prophecy with... Um, the first three heads being Babylon, Media, Persia, and Greece, and the last four heads being these divisions of Rome, first uh, pagan Rome, but then finally the last three uh, divisions of papal Rome, uh, really which would be the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet are represented as the last three heads of the beast of Revelation 13. Now, this is, the, of course, the papal beast. And and we saw the differences with the crowns and, and uh, that there's – set crowns on the seven heads of the beast of revelation 12, but there's no crowns on the heads of the beast of revelation 13, but there is crowns on the 10 horns. And then of course, there's no crowns on the heads of the horns in the beast of revelation 17. So where we've been trying to, when we looked at revelation 17 is to say that, that, the the uh, heads can't be the same as obviously both Revelation 12 and 13. And could the seven heads then be something different? Now, because the beast of Revelation 13 is describing this woman 
sitting upon this beast and and that she's going to be on that this beast has seven heads which are seven mountains we equated this beast now to the kingdoms of this world um the woman riding the beast is obviously the papacy and and so she can't be one of the the heads and then we also noticed that it seems that the kings the seven kings are not the seven heads that it doesn't say the seven heads are seven mountains which are seven kings it says the seven heads are seven mountains upon which the woman sitteth and there are seven kings five are fallen so so we haven't really defined what these kings would be though we looked at a possibility that those kings could be referring to the presidents of the United States in our time um which would align with what Colin was saying so that they they somehow are connected with that and we have to then figure out the time element of how to place that so before we completed that we went to Bob Pickle's paper and started reading through and seeing some of the problems and then we're going to come back uh, to Rye Smith's paper and again look at Revelation 17. Now I don't know if we can get that all finished by today and tomorrow we'll probably still be working on this into next week but but that's what we've been doing and and trying to understand that and anybody watching these videos who has any ideas please put them in the comments in the YouTube video. It's very, very helpful if, for other people, if somebody has questions or comments, to put them there because then people can see them when they look at the videos. Uh, sometimes people just write me emails and, and sometimes I share those emails if they're really pertinent, but most of the time, you know, I don't end up doing that so people don't get to be involved in that discussion. So if you put your comments in the YouTube video, that's the best. Okay, so, so Bob Pickle here is going to start talking about the significance of the crown, the crowns. There appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads. So he asked, why are the crowns upon the heads? While the dragon is primarily Satan, it is also secondarily pagan Rome. We know that from Ellen White's comment on that in Great Controversy. Since it was through pagan Rome that Satan persecuted the church after Christ's ascension. Um, since pagan Rome had a strong central government, having crowns upon the seven heads of the dragon would make sense. So we went through this before. Um, and uh, now you can see the problem here is that he's going to think that whatever the heads are, they're going to be the same. So he says they're the seven forms of Roman government. He's made that argument. Um, and then he notes that uh, there is no names of blasphemy or there's names of blasphemy upon the seven heads in the beast of Revelation 13, but no crowns on the heads. Instead, they're upon the horns. And he asked the question, why? So he's going to have an answer to that. Now, Papal Rome was not the strong central government that pagan Rome had been. Papal Rome consisted of independent, sovereign nations held together by a common religion headed by the Pope. Crowns upon the horns instead of upon the heads symbolized this fact. It was the horns that were sovereign, not the beast itself. So, um, and we can see that that definitely relates to Papal Rome. So we, we would agree with that, that the papacy itself is not the sovereign it, during that 1260 years of the papacy, but it is um, still connected. Now we have the papacy that is papal Rome as one of the heads, the way that we understand it. He has it as one of the forms of Roman government, right? Which he's going to have as the seventh form of Roman government. Um, but we're going to say that this is more consistent uh, with, uh, no, and there's no problem that the papacy is one of those heads. And, and what this shows, because this is the leopard-like beast, we're saying that it's consistent that um, these heads represent the different kingdoms of Bible prophecy. Even though those kingdoms aren't acting in the time of the papacy, they still have the characteristics because it has, it's a leopard-like beast with the feet of a bear, the mouth of a lion, right? Um, so it's, it's the body of leopard, it's grease, it's got 
uh, uh, Babylon, Greece, and um, Medo-Persia in it. And then, of course, the aspect of Rome is its composite character, because Rome is uh, synchronistic. It brings syncretism, syncretism, yeah, syncretistic. Anyway, it brings all of these elements together from these different nations that preceded it. So there's no problem having these heads representing uh, those, those kingdoms, because that's what the beast represents. But it's a papal beast. And, and one of the heads is wounded, right? So we know that the head that's wounded uh, would be the papal head. We know that. It, it's clear. Ellen White is clear on that. So it's the papal head that's wounded. And that's, that's one of the heads of this beast. But it's still the papacy. Right? And the papacy, of course, is a continuation of paganism but dressed up in Christian garb. So it shows it's synchronistic, uh, syncretistic, maybe syncretistic, syncretistic uh, nature. <clears throat> anyway, so that's what we see here um, with this beast. Now he says a similar picture is found in Daniel chapter two, clay holds together iron fragments, fragments somewhat in the feet and toes. Now we know that Ellen White says that the iron and the clay represent uh, churchcraft and statecraft. So uh, really with the iron representing uh, uh, statecraft and the clay representing churchcraft. Um, that's how we understand that. Now, it is often presented in evangelistic series that the iron and the clay mingling themselves uh, refers to what happens with uh, the, the nations of Europe intermarrying their, uh, their royalty to try to uh, arrive at unity. But I don't know if that's really the main point of that. I think, based on Alan White's statement, that this has to do more with the mixing of church and state. <clears throat> so then he's going to look at the beast of Revelation 17. So he carried me away into the spirit, in the spirit, into the wilderness. And I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet colored beast full of names of blasphemy, having said seven heads and ten horns. So we know here there's no crowns upon these horns. And then he's going to quote from Joseph Bates, which we read yesterday. And we can see that there are some problems here in this understanding. But there are some things that are interesting. So the beast that was denotes the Roman Republic that was 1900 years ago. So what? What Bates is saying is that we have the Roman Republic. It exists um, for all that period of Rome up until Imperial Rome comes into power. So under Imperial Rome, you no longer have a republic. So first you had a monarchy, then you had a republic, and it had different forms of government within that republic. So it wasn't just one form. And But then you have with... Uh, uh, Caesar Augustus, you then have uh, in the emperors, the imperial Rome, and and so that's going to be that it is not. Right. And then you're going to have this period of time while it is not is going to end in 538 when the seventh form of Roman government comes, that's papal Rome. Um, but then it says he is the eighth, the eighth undoubtedly as we have shown, the two-horned beast with its image, a symbol of the people of Republican America, as they are and will be, and is of the seven. So he's saying that uh, the eighth is going to be republicanism. That's what's going to arise in 1798, and that's going to be the eighth head. Right, so the eighth, or the eighth, it's, it's one of the forms of Roman government, but it's going to arise in 1798. So that's the view basically of Bates, though it comes from the pioneer view, understanding that uh, the heads represent forms of Roman government. So he is equating the eighth will cause all under its influence to worship the one that is called the seventh. So there's some things nice about Bates view is that he takes the, 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 the beast that rises up out of the earth in Revelation 13 as the eighth, the eighth head, right? 
And, and this sort of makes sense. Now, there are problems with this view, which we were discussing yesterday, but I was really tired. My mind wasn't working well by the end of the study, so we kind of closed it up. But we obviously couldn't have got finished yesterday anyway. Um, so if we're talking about the beast, the question is, what beast? Now, if we're saying that this beast here in Revelation 17 is, uh, it's definitely not the beast, it's not the dragon from Revelation 12. And if it's the beast that the woman's sitting upon from Revelation 17, um, we have some problems in that the woman is the papacy. And if the seven heads represent the seven forms of Roman government, one of them is papal, then the woman who is the papacy riding this beast is, is riding the papacy as well, because this beast includes all of these governments of the world uh, or these forms of Roman government. Now we're saying it's the governments of the world that's being written upon. And that's symbolized by the seven hills of Rome, which are seven mountains, right? The seven mountains. So the seven heads are the seven mountains or hills of Rome, through which the papacy then controls the governments of the world. That's the idea that's there in Revelation 17. So you can see because of these different views, it gets, gets confusing. But the beast that was and is not that must be referring not to the beast of Revelation 17, but to the beast of Revelation 13. Because it can't, and, and it can't be said, now, of course, they're going to try to reply, apply this to the Roman Republic. But then they're going to, what is the beast of Revelation 17? Right? So th there's the problem, because it says the beast that was and is not. Now, you can't really say the beast of Revelation 13 was in the time of John, right? That's the problem. You understand what I'm saying? So if you're saying that this is from the period in which John is, that the explanation is coming, and you're saying five are fallen, those are five forms of Roman government, and and one and and it is not, so it was, it is not, that's the period of imperial Rome. And it shall ascend out of the bottomless pit, which would be uh, papal Rome. In the time of John, the only beast that was, so because this isn't about the heads, right? this is about the beast that was and is not. It's not about five are fallen, one is. So when you talk about the one that is, if that's imperial Rome, how do we address that to the beast here, right? Yeah. And not explaining it well. But you see the problem. There's a difference between the heads of the beast and the beast itself. And, and if you decide that this beast is papal Rome, you can't from John's day say the beast was. Right? Now, maybe there's something wrong with my thinking. But this is where a problem that I've always had with Revelation 17 is trying to figure out the time context, when is this? We want to know what the is is, when it is not. And the thing that makes the most sense is to talk about this as being sometime after 1798. But if we're talking about this beast that was, is it the beast of Revelation 13, the papal beast, or is it talking about the beast of Revelation 17? And to me, in, in how I'm reading that, and we're going to look at that again right, right away, um, that uh, let's, let's go there. So again, just explaining my problems that I have. And I'm not saying that everybody has the same problems as me. Now, now, Stephen, did you watch the last few studies? Because you weren't here live. Uh, I got that some pieces. Okay. So, you know, hopefully you have some insight into this. So you understand what I said in, in the summary 
that all made sense of what we had come to conclude so far. That made sense to you? Um, I'm still sort of trying to get my head around it. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I, I don't blame you. Um, so, so the basic idea is that, that we've concluded that since the beasts are different, there's no reason to assume that the heads are all symbolizing the same thing. So in Revelation 12, the heads symbolize the forms of Roman government. That's a possibility. The pioneer view could still stand there. But in Revelation 13, that can't be the case. It must be the kingdoms of Bible prophecy. But in Revelation 17, there's no reason to assume that it's the same as either of the first two. And it actually tells us what the seven heads are in this beast. The seven heads are the city of Rome that rests on seven hills. And the woman through the city of Rome is controlling the kingdoms of this world. So it's, it's presently what we have. Uh, the papacy sits upon these seven heads, which are seven hills, seven mountains. And, and if that's the case, we would also then say, well, the horns, these are the United Nations, right? So these 10 horns are not the same 10 horns as we see in uh, the papal beast. That is, during the papal beast, they're going to be the divisions of, of Europe. And in the pa pagan Rome, uh, they're going to be uh, the tribes, the, the way that Rome is is initially divided, at least that's one way of looking at it. We also could say that maybe they represent the 10 emperors, but that's, that's, that's not really important. Some of these details are not that important here, just to know the fact that they don't always represent the same thing or have to represent the same thing. And so the UN is definitely not 10 parts, um, but it symbolizes the whole world. So in our time, we can see that the papacy is riding this beast, which is the kingdoms of this world, through the city of Rome, and that there are 10 horns. And those horns represent the United Nations, which definitely are connected in some way with the papacy. That, that, that re relationship between the UN and the papacy, they have some common interests. They also have some differences because one is the dragon power and one is the beast. They're not fully in agreement, but they do cooperate and work together. And then it says there are seven kings. So when it talks about there being seven kings, what's always assumed is that the seven kings are equated with the seven heads, which are seven mountains. But that doesn't really follow especially if we look at the seven heads represent Rome, that is the civil power of Rome, upon which the Roman Catholic Church resides, and the ten horns represent the UN, then these ten kings must represent the other power, the false prophet, or not set ten kings, seven kings. And and if that's the case, can we say that these are the presidents of the United States, just as Colin has laid out? Uh, and, and in this case, we have to decide whether we're going to start them with Reagan or with uh, Bush. Um, so that, that's just one of the problems we still have to sort out. But if they are the kings, the presidents of the United States, this would show that in Revelation 17, all three, the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet are all being represented. The dragon power by the ten horns. The papacy, even though this woman is riding it, we're talking about the governments of the world. That's the papal government, the city of Rome, upon which the woman sits. And then you have these seven kings mentioned, which would then be the false prophet. And, and this seems consistent. It's very different in some ways from what we have understood, but it actually aligns with it quite well. It, it preserves in this way that we've looked at these things, it preserves the pioneer view as foundational, but incomplete. 
And um, it doesn't contradict anything we see in the Bible or the spirit of prophecy. It doesn't conflict with the 1843 chart. But it is kind of a unique view, not something that we anticipated uh, when we began this study. So, so when we look at the beast that, that thou sawest was and is not, so in verse 8, we have to remember that this has to happen. Why this is being said is because he's he's going to um, tell the uh, the mystery of the woman. So he's going to tell John the mystery of the woman and of the beast which carrieth her. Now, if, in order to do that, he's going to refer back to the beast of Revelation 13. Because you can't say of the beast that's there that it was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit. If you're in the time of John, you could argue that this is in 1798 that the explanation is occurring. And then you could say, well, the beast that was and is not shall ascend out of the bottomless pit. Right. So you could say that if you're going to take the time element in which the explanation is, you, you could do that. But then you still have some other problems, which which we've noted. So one is you have this beast. If this beast with the woman is riding is the papacy, that doesn't really make sense. But it would make sense if the beast here is the beast of Revelation 13, because he's trying to explain the woman riding this beast in Revelation 17 by referring to the beast in Revelation 13. But he's also talking about the beast in Revelation 17, because he's going to say the seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. That's obviously talking about the seven heads of the beast of Revelation 17. So we still have some problems, no matter how we look at it. Now, we could say that when he sees the scarlet color beast in Revelation 17, that what we're doing is we're differentiating uh, the beast of Revelation 13 by bringing that woman out of it. So putting her instead of one as one of the heads that we would have in Revelation 13, and now just showing her riding this beast. But the heads then wouldn't be the same heads. So, so we, I don't know how to explain that. Other than to say, when the beast that thou sawest was and is not, must be referring to the papacy itself. Because we can't say this about the kingdoms of this world. To try to say, well, this is just republicanism, that doesn't make any sense to me. But, you know, that's what that Joseph Bates saw. That's what Bob Pickle sees. But I, I think we can say that that's what's being he's trying to explain this woman riding this scarlet colored beast. And and so the beast that thou sawest was and is not has to refer to this beast just in the, maybe even this general sense. Revelation 13, Revelation 17. It's the kingdoms of this world. Right. But it's focused here upon this being the papacy. So in this case, when we look at the beast of Revelation 13, which is the papal beast, we can say that that beast was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit after 1798. So we would say that the explanation here has to be after 1798, but before the Sunday law. OK, so we're going to come back to this, but I just wanted to to make that clear. So we're going to go back to Bob Pickle's paper. And um, if anybody has any thoughts on that as well, it'll be hopefully that makes it clearer. So some of his stuff doesn't really make sense in the context of what we've talked about. So he says there's, and we went through this yesterday, there's, there's, he's going to try to say this, sending out of the bottomless pit, that this is um, uh, going to be addressing uh, republicanism, right? So it's it's a very strange argument. Um, so he said, let's just go back here. So he, he gives these things that they're going to be connected with Islam. So he's going to show that that there's this connection with Islam. Um, 
and then he's going to say that uh, that uh, true historicists, and this is just to me one of the weirdest sort of arguments he's made. Um, uh, where is it here? Okay, there is indeed something, and that something is republicanism. So the question is, going back, uh, there's four different interpretations of what the bottomless pit is. Is there nothing that ties these symbols together? And he says it's republicanism, an atheistic brand of republicanism or democracy wreaked havoc during the French Revolution. So he's going to take the statements about Islam, um, Revelation 9-11, and Revelation 11, 7, atheism. And Revelation 17, verse 8, um, he's obviously going to place at that with the beast that was and is not what it is not is, is that period of time in that uh, we don't have um, a republic, right? And then it shall ascend to the bottomless pit. That's the United States reviving republicanism. Um, and that's going to be this uh, beast coming out of the earth that had two horns like a lamb and spake as a dragon. So he's going to now address this dragon power. So this is the United States. Now, I just, I just have such a difficult time with this explanation. So he says, a Protestant brand of republicanism gave birth to the freedoms found, found in the United States and the Muslims. So we have the French Revolution, the United States, and now the Muslims. And he takes this quote from the New World of Islam, uh, pages six and seven, uh, by Loth Lothrop Stoddard. Anyway, in Mecca, despotism was impossible. The fierce freeborn Arabs of the desert would tolerate no master, and their innate democracy had been sanctioned by the prophet, who had explicitly declared that all believers were brothers. The Meccan Caliphate was a theocratic democracy. Abu Bakr and Omar were elected by the people and held themselves responsible to public opinion. Well, this to me is a very weak way to look at things. First, we know that is true that uh, early Islam did not have a king, right? And, and locusts don't have a king. Though they're going to get a king in the period of Othman. So to say that the coming out of the bottomless pit is republicanism just doesn't really make any sense to me. And, and it's sort of a, an atheistic brand of republicanism or democracy. But that, that's going to be his view. Um, it's, it's not really the pioneer's view, but it's sort of his view or spin on the pioneer's view, especially Bates, Bates' view. Uh, so he said, so when we read the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth and is of the seven and goeth into perdition. We are reading about a confederacy of republics, a revival of the republican form of government of old Rome. Republicanism and democracy is the only conceivable tie between the four passages. Now, you see the problem here, hopefully. So he's saying um, we have the seventh is is the papacy. That's the papal form of government. And then we get this eighth, and this is this confederacy of republics, a revival of the republican form of government of old Rome, and that this is the beast, this, this is coming up out of the bottomless pit. So does that make sense to anybody? I mean, it doesn't make sense to me. Maybe sometimes when you look at something for the first time, but I I, I just don't see the sense that um, you know he's going to come up out of the bottomless pit. So this is so, so I don't know. It, it it just doesn't sit well with me. Well, let's go on and read what he says. Okay, Revelation talks about the dragon and several beasts. How do we keep from confusing one beast with another? So Revelation 13 gives us a clue. So we went through this a little bit in, uh, yesterday. The first beast of, beast of Revelation 13, 1 to 10 seems to be consistently called throughout the book, the beast. The second beast of 13, 11 is identified as another beast, right? And then we then is never called a beast again. And instead to prevent confusion, he is called the false prophet. 
And um, in all three of these passages, he appears alongside the beast, the dragon, the beast, the false prophet. Both are pictured together. One is called the beast. The other is called the false prophet. What this suggests is that whenever we read about the beast, we must be reading about the first beast of Revelation 13. And that's why I say when we look at um, verse 18, it says the beast that was and is not. To me, it seems to be talking about the papal beast, the beast that thou sawest was and is not. If John sees things that he has already seen before, he prefaces his words with the. If he has seen something new, he omits the the. So he carried me away into the spirit, into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scholarly colored beast. So he's saying that this is a different beast, which we would agree. It's not the beast of Revelation 13. Apparently, John is indicating what he has seen, something new, something different than the beast he saw in Revelation 16, 13, dragging the beast and the false prophet. We would then expect that in every place afterwards where the first beast of Revelation 13 is intended, he will be identified as the beast in every place where the beast of Revelation 17 is intended. Some sort of qualifier will be added to enable us to distinguish him from the first beast of Revelation 13. What makes this more apparent is the fact that Revelation 16, 13 pictures the dragon, beast and false prophet all involved in getting people to the Battle of Armageddon. Then when we have the scarlet colored beast of Revelation 17, uh, then we then we have the scholar colored beast of Revelation 17. Then we have an actual picture of the Battle of Armageddon in Revelation 19, 19, in which the dragon, beast, and false prophet are all seen. Clearly, the beast of 1613 must be the same as the beast of 1920, in as, as much as the scarlet beast of chapter 17 is a beast instead of the beast, he must be a totally different beast set apart by some sort of qualifiers whenever he wherever he is mentioned. And the woman said, and the angel said unto me, wherefore didst thou marvel? I will tell thee the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carrieth her, which hath seven heads and ten horns. So we can say that this is the beast, the scarlet colored beast. Um, the beast that thou sawest was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit. Which beast? Now he says the scarlet beast. Republican was the order of the day before Augustus Caesar. It was not in John's day. It would ascend and be a dominant force in the end. But couldn't we say that the beast that thou sawest, now he says, because it says that thou sawest, but does that mean it's referring to the beast of Revelation 17? Because in Revelation 13, did he also see the beast? Right. So in Revelation 13, if we go there, I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns. So he's also seen this beast. But this is the only beast where he could say that the beast that thou sawest was and is not, right? Because this beast, the papacy, has the papacy come to an end as it received a deadly wound. And Ella White's clear that the deadly wound refers to the papacy. So if we're looking at Revelation 17 then, And he's going to explain the mystery of the woman and the beast that carrieth her, which is the city of Rome and its connection to um, the UN. Then the beast that thou sawest was and is not could not be referring to the scarlet colored beast of Revelation 17, because he's going to be explaining this woman that's riding the scarlet colored beast. And in order to do so, he's going to refer us back to the beast of Revelation 13. This beast that received a deadly wound. Because that's why it is not. And it shall ascend out of the bottomless pit. Does that make sense to people that this beast must be the beast of Revelation 13 and not the scarlet colored beast? Or do people think um, I'm wrong in this point?
Any thoughts on that? I know it's tough to come to a decision. Is it possible that I'm correct? Maybe that's a better question. Well, the, the Scarlet Carnet, Scarlet Connard case, I say that as the, the papacy uh, and the church and state relationship. And then in 1798, that relationship was ended. There was no more church and state until that deadly wound is healed and you have a church and state relationship restored again. Okay, so so in, so you're saying that the beast of Revelation 17 with the woman riding it is going to just ind indicate the church-state relationship. But the scarlet-colored beast, that means one of the heads then is just the papal government, not the papacy. Because the woman is the papacy. And so, and then you would have to explain what, why the seven heads are the seven mountains. Do those refer to the city of Rome? Right. Because we went through all this, this uh, before trying to figure this out. But you're still maintaining the same view then that the heads in this beast would be the same heads as the beast of Revelation 13, Babylon, etc. Right? Because we have the woman riding the beast. That's the problem. Yes. So okay. it's like a, a church and state. It will not be the beast there. As the woman as the church. But the, yeah. in, the situ, in the situation where she's in control, in a sense, she's also the beast. As well, yeah, but since yeah, she's writing it, yeah, but I don't, yeah, I understand what you're saying, and that's how we would try to resolve it. But if we see that the beast represents the kingdoms of this world, in that it has seven heads, which is the city of Rome, and that's where the woman sits, right? That's how she controls this beast through Rome. But the ten horns represent. The kingdoms of this world in the more sense of the UN, right? This would make more sense that 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 woman can't be part of that beast. You understand what I'm saying? That, that we have to differentiate between the woman and the beast. And if the beast is just the city of Rome with, with the seven heads and the ten horns being the symbol of the whole world, then that would be consistent. Because, so, yes, I would agree. If we're going to say the beast that was and is not, and even he is the eighth, and that we're referring to the scarlet-colored beast, then that beast must be a papal beast, right? Because we can't say of the kingdoms of the world uh, that they were and are not and will be, Right? I know that's complicated, but you can see we have to make a choice. We have to decide if it's the case that this scarlet colored beast is the papal beast itself. Then one, one problem we have here is, is the horns are not part of the papacy in that sense. So, so it has to be the kingdoms of this world. But it, it has to include just the civil aspects of this world, right? Because the woman is the church. She's fornicating with this beast. And this beast must be in some way the kingdoms of this world. You would agree with me there. Yes. Okay. But the beast itself can't then include the papacy. It can include the city of Rome, the civil aspect of the Roman city, because that's where the woman's going to sit. 
But I, so maybe, you know, we could try to argue. So we could try to say, well, if the seven heads are the seven kingdoms, one of them is the papal head. It received a deadly wound. So it's it's finished. Um, but but it doesn't say that one of the heads was and is not. It says the beast that thou sawest was and is not. Right. You, you can see the problem, uh, at least. Um, yeah, I'll have to think about it. Yeah, I, I know. I've had to think about it quite a bit, too. <laughs> yeah, it, it's not. It, but, but if we just say that the beast that thou sawest was and is not is a reference to the beast of Revelation 13, then, then we quite easily see how the woman and the scarlet-colored beast are different from each other. That is, the woman is the papacy. The scarlet-colored beast is just the kingdoms of this world. The seven heads represent the place where the woman sits, which is Rome, and the seven and the ten horns represent the United Nations. And then this beast that thou sawest is just an explanation of what we see of this woman riding the beast. So John is brought back to look at the beast of Revelation 13. And, and then here we can easily equate that, that the beast of Revelation 13 was and is not, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit. That's easy to do with the beast of Revelation 13, because it clearly is the papal beast. It's papal Rome. And and so so we would have to say what we see here in Revelation 17 is sometime after 1798 and sometime before uh, we have this beast ascend out of the bottomless pit, which would have to be at the time of the Sunday law. Because that's going to be. Um, they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names are not written in the book of the life of book of life from the foundation of the world when they behold the beast that was and is not and yet is. And and so that's going to be at the end of the world. Then the, the other part that we'd have to say is the time element. So exactly when is it that John is? So that is the question is, where is this location? that John is brought to time-wise. And then when it says uh, the seven heads are seven mountain, oh, where is it here? Uh, the beast, now I gotta go further. And I didn't share the screen here, did I? Yes, I still have the screen shared, so I gotta go here. Um, um, so that's when we get here to, uh, yeah, verse 10. There are seven kings, five are fallen, one is. So the one is, we have to ask, when is is. So how can we show where John is exactly? Because if those five kings, or the seven kings, but if the first five that are fallen are presidents of the United States, then we'd have to say, when is the, the sixth king, and how could we place John wherever we're going to place him in, in the time that we are in, in the presidents of the United States? But it seems clear to me that the seven kings are not the seven heads or the seven mountains. But again, this is just something new that we're looking at from what we what we studied. But this this does what this would do is place these seven kings in their primary application to presidents of the United States. But the question is, how would we show that? How could we show that this is the time? in which 
John is being given the explanation. And that is, we're not going to put the explanation in the time of John. And we've shown why that is. We went to Daniel chapter 8 to show that. That you don't have to put him. This is uh, something that that they assert. Uh, Bob Pickle, uh, Uriah Smith, the pioneers, they would assert that we have to be at 1798. We have to be at the time of the end um, for the vision. But when we have the explanation, we have to be in John's day. It doesn't it doesn't work that way, right? So we know it's not in John's day that the explanation, I mean, it's given to John then, but the time element doesn't move to John's day. So the is is not John's day. The is is something else. And, and we would have to say it's after 1798, but the question is, can we put that is in the time of which we are living with the presidents of the United States? But yeah, I know, I know what, you know, I know how we've looked at it before, and we've said, well, it's possible, but it creates this this contradiction with the be- the woman riding this beast. Now, again, that's always been my problem with that that interpretation. That maybe has not been a problem for everyone, but to differentiate this woman to say she's What's that, Angela? Oh, I was just going to, I was just looking at Revelation 17, 1 again, where it says, and there came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials. Well, that's talking about the seven last plagues, right? Well, the time of the seven last plagues is right toward the end of all things as we know it and Christ coming. So why couldn't then the seven kings be the seven U.S. presidents? I okay. Mean, well, so one of the things right that we looked at, Okay, I understand what you're saying. So the idea is that, well, this is one of the angels that had the seven last plagues, um, which is something still future. So the seven last plagues don't begin until after uh, the close of probation, until Satan is... Uh, I realize um, that, but we, we can see things winding down now. I thought, well, how can we bring, if, if what Colin and now you're saying is possible... How can we bring it into this time period? Like to me, I I feel we're right on on the brink of the close of probation and Christ coming of the Sunday law before that. So, yeah. mm-hmm. that's so that's workable. That, yeah. So I would say that the fact that it's one of the angels that has the seven last plagues, yes, it definitely puts it at the end of the world. Now, now these angels that has these vials, I mean, they're going to pour them out in Revelation sixteen, right? So sometimes people have this this huge problem because they think that we just read this chronologically, right? This this is progressive. So whatever happened in Revelation 16, Revelation 17 must be after that, right? Which, of course, makes no sense. It's a repeat and enlarge. They keep introducing these ideas and they... um, and, And there's a context of why we have the seven last plagues there in Revelation 16, um, but you're going to have these plagues poured out. And we know that the the sixth plague, where you're going to have uh, the Battle of Armageddon, I mean, that's still future. So we haven't come to that point. And then you have the seventh plague. And um, uh, so this is going to be, um, you know, final. It basically represents the second coming. But... Um, so you can't have then Revelation 17 going back to some time or going, continuing on from the second coming. It has to go back to some time before. But it's one of the, it's, it's one of the seven angels that had the seven vials, right? So remember, he's seen things in vision. He sees these vials poured out. But one of those angels is going to come to him and say, I will show thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters. Now, it's going to then go back to explain who this whore is. And in chapter 18, we're going to see the judgment of the great whore. That's going to be the fall of Babylon, right? So so it's the angels who poured out those, those plagues, one of the plagues, is going to come to John and say, I'm going to show you the judgment of the great whore. And then 
So then he's going to be carried away into the period in which the papacy sat, right, or existed. He sees this woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns, right? So these seven heads are the city of Rome. The ten horns are the divisions of this world symbolically. Now, of course, in the time of 1260, it's going to be the nations of Europe. But at the end of the world, it has to be the United Nations. Right? So, so we, we're not saying that the ten horns are literally something, the same thing all the time, because they're a symbol of the whole world. So the papacy is going to control the whole world. But he's going to see the papacy in the wilderness. Right? So he's going to show him the papacy there. And um, and he's going to see the woman drunken with the blood of the saints. And, and John's going to marvel about this. But he says, I'm going to show you the mystery of the woman and the beast that carrieth her, which hath seven heads and ten horns. Now, the way that we've looked at this before, there, there's it's still... You know, it's still acceptable. In some ways, we could just say, well, this is the period of the papacy during the 1260. He's just describing she had seven heads. And those those heads then are going to be the kingdoms of this world and ten horns. But the but the real problem here, if we're talking about the woman and the beast, they, they are differentiated. Right. The woman is not the beast. Now, we could say, well, the beast and the woman are the same thing. Uh, they're just together in this unit, and it's all just a papal beast. But really, the woman is the church. It's the Roman Catholic Church. It's the papacy. And we could just say, well, that's the religious aspect of the papacy. And the beast represents the, the civil aspect of the papacy. But we know that if these heads are the same heads in Revelation 13, if that's what we're arguing. One of those heads receives a deadly wound. And that deadly wound, the, the one that receives the deadly wound is the papacy, right? So we have the papacy receiving a deadly wound. But this is gonna say, this beast that thou sawest was and is not. Well, we know that that's the papal beast that was and is not. So in the time in which John is, the papal beast is not, and it shall ascend out of the bottomless pit. That makes sense for the beast of Revelation 13, but it doesn't make sense for the beast of Revelation 17 if the beast of Revelation 17 is the papal beast. Because if it's the civil power, because the woman is the papacy, you can't say it was and is not, and yet is. You can say that of the papacy, of the papal beast. But you can't say that of the kingdoms of this world that the woman is riding, which this beast must be, even if it contains some aspect of the papacy, one of the heads. This beast itself never ceases to exist. So the pioneer view is going to say what ceased to exist was the form of Roman government called republicanism, and that's going to be the eighth. That's going to be the thing that revives. So, no, it's, it's, a, it's difficult to get our minds around it. You have to know all the different elements and look at them. You know, so if we're going to argue that this beast that's being described, that was and is not, is just the civil powers, that can't be the case. It has to be a papal beast. So, I mean, we could argue that this woman is the church. It's riding this beast that includes the papacy. But it can't just be the papal beast that the woman rides the papal beast. Right? Because the woman is fornicating with the nations. Right? So, to me, it makes sense to, to say that this this scarlet colored beast is not the same as the beast of Revelation 13. We can agree with that. And since it's not the same, what is it, right? 
Is it just the papacy at the end of the world? We could say modern Rome, right? But what does that mean, you know, in the context that why does it have these different characteristics? And why is the woman riding it? Why not just, you know, have, have a beast without a woman riding it? So we know that we have this woman so that we can clearly distinguish uh, who this woman is, that it's the Catholic Church. I know, Stephen, does that help? Or Angela or anyone? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> so where we want to get to is these heads. Or not the heads, the kings, pardon me. So in verse 10, there are seven kings, five are fallen, one is, and the other is not yet come. When he cometh, he must continue a short space. So in all of my reading until this week, I had never considered that the seven kings were not the seven heads. But if we can see that the woman is the papacy, that the beast is, is the kingdoms of this world, and that the seven kings are an explanation of the false prophet at the end of the world, that is, the presidents of the United States, this would bring together all of these three parts of Babylon, the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet, in these verses. So these seven kings, they can't be seven popes, right, which is the most common way that when people try to apply these to people, to kings as some kind of ruler, uh, they use popes. But we can't place these as seven popes. And not that I know of. I, I haven't found a way to do that. I've looked at all the different views. But if we take these as the presidents of the United States, then this would make sense. We have seven kings, five are fallen, one is. And one is not yet come. So, so we have to get to the point. We have to show, we have to narrow this down to show us that this can be placed in either the day, the time of Trump. So if you're going to have Trump, you're going to say these seven kings. You're going to go uh, Reagan, Bush the first, um, uh, Clinton, uh, Bush the second, Obama. So those are the five that are fallen. The one is would be Trump. And the one that is not yet come is the globalists. They're going to uh, take, take over the United States. So Trump is the last president. Biden isn't really the one that's being counted, even though he is the president, as the one that is, or, or, or the other that is not yet come. So the other that is not yet come would refer to something within the United States that wouldn't be a person. And when he cometh, he must continue a short space. And the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth. That's the papacy. That's the beast of Revelation 13. And is of the seven. Now, when he says he's of the seven, it does not say he is one of the seven. So then we would have to explain if he's of the seven. And the word there... Um, he comes from where he proceeds from the seven. Um, and, and so this would show some kind of union with the presidents of the United States and the papacy is what it would show him. It would be showing. It would not say that the eighth is another um, head, so to speak or even another king. But he's the thing that follows those seven kings. So he, he comes from the seven, his origin, where he proceeds from, where he's connected. So the word here, um, ek, um, epsilon kappa is the, the Greek spelling. A primary preposition denoting origin, that is the point whence motion or action proceeds, 
from, out of, right? After, among, or betwixt, by, exceeding, for, um, etc. It's all these different ways in which it's translated based upon context. Um, often used in composition with the same general import, often of completion, right? So the fact that he's the eighth, this, this completes this. He comes out of the seven. It's the natural progression that has happened. And if we start with Reagan, Reagan is going to be the one that makes the league with the papacy. So even though he's not at the time of the end in, in the way that, uh, like, if we compare this with the seven kings of, of Persia, we're not making a direct comparison that way. To get to these seven kings, we're simply addressing this league with Rome. And so we're going to start with Reagan. So Reagan, Bush the first, um, uh, Clinton, and then Bush the second, and then Obama. Those are the five that are following. And so we can place it there because we know that these seven kings have this league with Rome. That's why Rome, the beast in its resurrection, that ascends, that was, that is not, and yet is, it's going to come after the seventh. Now, we're not saying the seventh president here in this case, because we don't think that Biden is the president of the United States. There's been a, a league made with Rome at the beginning of this period. Right. So we know we know the United States reaches its hand across the Gulf and grasp the hand of the Roman power. That happened with Reagan. And then it's going to reach across the abyss and join with the dragon power, right? That's globalism. That is occurring. But what next has to happen is the papacy has to step in. We need this, this union. So the United States is this bridging this gulf, gulf between the papacy and the dragon power. But they have to all be pulled together in the Sunday law. And so the eighth is simply going to be when we see that manifest. We're going to see the Sunday law, right? That would be the next thing. But to focus upon now upon the presidents of the United States, once this seventh king has come in, I would just say that this, this seventh, the one, the other that's not yet come here at this time, has to be um, connected to this uh, threefold union. So the seventh, you're going to have, so you have the United States. That's the first five and the one that is. The seventh now, this seventh king, is this dragon power joining with the United States. And then you have the beast that was and is not even, he is the eighth and is or proceeds from, or comes from, or its origin is found in the seven and goeth into perdition. So its origin, its resurrection, is the result of what the United States did beginning with Reagan to bring about this union. And then it says, the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings, which have received no kingdom as yet. So one of the reasons we have to say that these are the United Nations and that they receive a king, a kingdom, because they receive power as kings one hour with the beast. That is the Sunday law. And that we can't put that, that these horns, these 10 kings, are simply the 10 divisions of Europe. So even though we see these 10 horns as part of this beast upon which the woman sits, it symbolizes the, the world. But this world becomes kings in this context in the time of the Sunday law. These have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. When that occurs, then we have the Sunday law. These shall make war with the lamb and the lamb shall overcome them. And for he is Lord of lords and king of kings and they that are with him are called and are chosen and faithful. And he saith unto me, the waters which thou sawest, where the whore sitteth, are peoples and multitudes, nations and tongues. And the ten 
horns which thou sawest upon the beast. These shall hate the whore and shall make her desolate and naked and eat her flesh and burn her with fire. So we know that this is at the end of the world. This is going to happen still. This hasn't happened yet. Now, some people do try to make this to happen already, right? They'll just say, well, this were the kings of, of Europe, and they eventually turn on the papacy. This is going to bring you to 1798, right? Um, and it says, for God hath put in their hearts to fulfill his will and to agree and give their kingdom unto the beast until the words of God shall be fulfilled. And the woman which thou sawest is that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. So that great city is Babylon, right? This is, of course, the papacy. This is the woman, the mother of harlots, the abominations of the earth, and she reigns over the kings of the earth. So the, the beast, this is the description of the woman and the beast that carrieth her. And so the beast that carries her is the kingdoms of this earth, which includes the seat of Rome, because that's the seat that she has. That's the, the saddle on this beast is these seven heads. These ten horns, these are the kingdoms of this world. This is the UN. So that's an explanation. Whether my view, and this tends to be, I think, my view, because I know you guys have been following as we've worked through this. Hopefully it's to some degree our view that we can see the sense of it. But this is still tentative. There still needs to be examined. right? But this seems to, to make everything fit. Doesn't mean that it's right. There might be things that we just don't see yet. Okay, but we, we've struggled with this quite a bit at this point. Okay, so let's go back to Bob Pickle and finish off his paper here. Okay. <clears throat> so he's going to take that these uh, kings are the forms of Roman government, and he's going to go through these different types of forms of Roman government that could uh, exist. Um So he's going to do some speculative things about this, but he's going to say that the seventh head is the medieval uh, papacy, um, the 1260 long years, uh, year, year long reign, right? Is it considered a, a short space? And, and you could do that. You could say it's a short time. It's, it's a period of time, right? But uh, we're saying that that's not the case, that we wouldn't have... Um, we wouldn't have the seven heads to be the forms of Roman government, and we wouldn't have the seven heads be the nations of Bible prophecy. Um, and definitely we don't equate the seven heads then with the seven kings. right? So that's going to be what he does, is he uh, equates it with the uh, seven heads with the seven mountains and the seven kings, and the seven kings are just forms of Roman government. Um but the thing about them being kings uh, sort of takes that away. It, it does seem like it's more referring to at least uh, the presidents of the United States fits in with that explanation. So he's going to just reiterate this view. And then he's going to talk about how different people have different opinions about how to count these things. Um, Um, uh, Matthew Henry's commentary the beast was seven heads seven mountains the seven hills on which Rome stands and seven kings seven sorts of government five are gone by when this prophecy was written so he uses both the hills of Rome and the forms of government that's going to be Matthew Henry um So he's just going to show support for his view from Protestant commentators. He talks about Uriah Smith's, uh, wrote an entire tract on the sub subject regarding Osiander. He writes, one of the earliest Protestant commentators, Osiander, as early as 1511, names the whole seven as we have them, namely kings, consuls, dissimilars, 
dictators, tremors, emperors, and popes as the forms of Roman government represented by the seven heads of the dragon of Revelation 12. We wouldn't have problems with that, but we would have problems with that being the, the heads of the beast of Revelation 13 and of Revelation 17. So we have no problem with the forms of Roman government for the beast of Revelation 12. Uh, William Miller says that these five forms of government, senatorial, tribunate, consular, decimiver, and triumvirate, these are fallen. One is when John wrote the prophecy, the imperial, and the other had not yet come. Kingly, which is the same as the ten horns. So he didn't apply it to the form of government being the papacy, but of the kingly power of the ten horns. Many says, so this is Miller again. In this verse, we are taught that John had a vision and saw himself standing among the tumultuous nations of the earth. And he saw the Roman kingdom rise up out of the nations, having seven forms of government or all kinds of governments. Seven being a perfect number in this prophecy. Heads denote governments or supreme powers. Republican, consular, disimilar, dictatorial, tarambarat, imperial, kingly. Right. So there's his view. Um. So then he's going to have some questions here, which we're not going to look at. So, so this view that we have just uh, presented over the last week is definitely a new view, but it is consistent with what has been taught in the past. It just adds more material. And so the question that we have to ask, because this is, would be new light, if we're going to take the view that we have, it ties together uh, a pioneer understanding of the understanding that this movement has had in the past and also presently what Colin has been presenting. It ties them together um, and shows that they're, they're, they're all connected, that they're, and there's no contradiction then. We, we wouldn't say, well, the pioneers were right and this movement was wrong, or this movement was right and the pioneers were wrong. And you understand what I'm saying there. By looking at it this way, we bring all these views together. We didn't, that wasn't the purpose of it. That's not what we were trying to do. We weren't trying, we were trying just to understand the passages and we looked at the different views. And we can see that all of them have light. That, that they're not wrong in, in a direct sense. They're just incomplete. And where the problem comes is when we look at Revelation 17, we've made assumptions from the understandings of the past that created contradictions in Revelation 17. Those contradictions are, you have a woman riding a beast. The woman can't be the same as the beast. She has to be something different. We have uh, the time element. So, if we're going to say it's in the time of John, it definitely does not work, even if we use uh, that the heads are forms of government. And especially does not work if we say uh, that the heads are the kingdoms of this world and we equate them with the uh, kings. Right. So the kingdoms of this world, then having this progression, five are fallen, one is. And that's been the view of this movement. Right. I've seen Jeff present it many times. Colin has presented it many times, many times, where what Colin would do is have these uh, water bottles lined up, you know, and illustrate, you know, the five that have fallen, you know, knock them over. There's one is, that's the United States, the one that's yet to come. That's going to be um, the UN, right? But then Colin introduced this new view, which... The way that he did it is he didn't reinterpret Revelation 17. He accepted Revelation 17, but he made an application of Revelation 17 based upon Daniel chapter 3 and Daniel chapter 11, uh, the beginning few verses, uh, to say that this is the United States because we can parallel the United States with uh, Medo-Persia. So we can take the Persian kings, and we can line them up with the United States. But we had problems lining those things up. We ended up with contradictions on how we would do that. 
Because if we're going to make that parallel, the times of the end, we know that we don't line up Reagan uh, with um, uh, Cyrus. We line up Reagan with uh, Darius the Mede. And so the first king of Persia is Cyrus. So that means we'd have to have the first one uh, to be uh, George Bush the first. So you would have George Bush, uh, Clinton, George Bush the second, Obama, and then Trump. That would have to be the five that have fallen. The one is would have to be um, Biden and the one that's to come someone else, right? So there was all these different ways in which we tried to deal with these seven kings of Persia and how they lined up with the seven presidents of the United States. So we still have to come back to that. We still have to now look at that and see how that fits in. But if we take that these seven kings are just seven presidents as a direct fulfillment of this prophecy, instead of being just a parallel, um, that creates a whole other way to look at these and so you definitely can begin with the one who makes the league you can begin with reagan as number one you can't do that if you're just lining up the parallel with the persian kings to get that <clears throat> okay so there's obviously other problems the woman uh you know, riding this beast, and when you have the beast, if the beast is the beast of Revelation 17 that says that if this beast was, is not, that creates a problem. Um, so the thing that we still have to do, so there's a number of things, but the one thing that, that always has plagued the interpretations of Revelation 17 is when is is. Right? Now, we can just say, well, we're just assuming because we started with the league that, um, and that's going to be Reagan, right? That we would just count. And so the is just becomes the time of Trump, right? But is there anything else that can tie us to Trump? to being the one that is. Something symbolic in these passages. <clears throat> so Revelation 17, 11, the beast that thou sawest was and is not. Even he is the eighth and is of the seven and goeth into perdition. Now we know that this verse, 17, 11, what does that do? What is 1711 as a symbol? Seven. Yeah, so we just simply multiply 17 by 11, and we get 187, right? And we know that the number 11. Seven one. That is, if we say uh, the eleventh verse of the seventeenth chapter, we just invert them. One 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 seven is the hundred and eighty seventh prime number. Right. So, so there's things there. Now, this is talking about well, the beast that was and is not. Even he is the eighth, and is of the seven or comes from the seven. So, it's going to talk about the seven kings in the verse before. So it's not going to talk about the seven kings in verse 11. But we can see that, that, that this would tie us to July 18th in this riddle, right? So now we know that's verse 11, and the riddle starts in verse 9. So we could just say, well, why, why are we choosing that one verse out of these these verses that just happens to be a symbol of 187. Okay, anything else here?
Okay, so any any other thing? Any other thing that we can notice here as a symbol? I'm just kind of looking at a few things. Okay, um, I'm just looking at some of the other symbols. Now, uh, one of the things we can say is the beast that thou sawest was and is not is mentioned in Revelation 17.8 and Revelation 17.11. Right. We have basically the same phrase. Now. Um, now, we know from the autumnal equinox to the spring equinox is 178 days. And from the spring equinox to the autumnal equinox is 187 days. Right. And as if you add 187 plus 178, you get 365. Right. And, and so we have those two verses tied together. We could look at them as a type of chiasm or something like that. Now, one is being represented with the 1711 to get the 187. The other one's just uh, 178. Now, 180, 178 is interesting because it is uh, a mixture of the numbers from 187. It's just another, another iteration of those three digits. Um, But does that help us tie it to July 18th, to our time, to the time of, of Trump? Because we're going to say Trump is the one. That's where he is. It is. Right? So Trump is, is the president on July 18, 2020. And so he would be the one that he is. Does that... Does that help us a bit as a symbol? Okay. It was seen to fit. Okay. Yeah, so, I mean, there must be more to it than what we're seeing. But as far as I can see, that that would be the most direct. So we're going to address this tomorrow. We're going to try to make a summation of this. Um, but there are still things that we have to look at in, in connection with uh, Daniel and so forth. But it is a unique view. It, it does take these kings and just place them directly as being fulfilled in our time as presidents of the United States and not as popes. And you can see why the popes doesn't make sense. But when you think about it and you study it the way that we have, that the presidents of the United States does make sense. And that there's no reason to see that the seven kings are the seven mountains or seven hands. So, okay, well, thanks for uh, everybody being here and joining in this study. Well, let's close with a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we are grateful for the time that we had here. I pray that you can watch over each person, uh, be with them in their struggles, be with Dwight, who's not here. I ask that you can help him in whatever struggles he's facing. And um, may your angels take care of each one. Thank you for this day. Bring us together again tomorrow according to thy will. 
pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen.